we've been talking about the topic of resourcing. And when I use the word resourcing, I'm talking about a felt sense of belonging, whether it's with yourself or, you know, within a family or a community or just us as humans, it's this felt sense of belonging. And there might be many reasons why we're not really feeling that. I think we all might be feeling that at some point or another, especially with recent events and us being, you know, a bit more isolated. But as you start to go maybe back out into the world and feeling into your sense of belonging, it's also important to recognize that there's this deep underlying sense of belonging that is unshakable, that is always present and has always been there. We spoke a little bit about that last week about inner resourcing and a, a felt sense of safety or peace or my favorite okayness. It's a nice place to start. Um, so that's what we talked about last week and I've been mentioning a bit about neuroscience and I wanted to share neuroscience with you uh, for a couple of reasons. One, I think it's fascinating and every time I hear about it in trainings or through my teachers or out in the world, I just find it really interesting the more and more we're getting to know and understand how our mind functions and our brain functions and these networks and what they mean and how that relates to our experience. As a meditator, the neuroscience is quite interesting because there's a couple different modes that we know about that we're entering into, and I'm gonna speak about two of them um, in just a short while. But before I get into the neuroscience, I think when we talk about resourcing and feeling a sense of belonging, we have to recognize that with belonging comes this fear that we won't belong. So even though we're talking about, you know, well-being and a sense of belonging, which can feel nice, for many of us, you start to notice where that's not true in your life or where you feel separate from that. And that's a natural thing to experience opposites in meditation. So as you're sensing well-being or a feeling of belonging, you'll notice all the ways in which you're not, whether it's personally with yourself or, you know, our lack of connection that we might be experiencing now. There's a bit of an underlying um, fear or loss of control that we have to recognize that is part of life. And when we want to fight that and control everything, it's really going to cause a lot of contraction and stress in our nervous system. And we're going to perceive that everything is a threat. And that is a very um, stress inducing lifestyle or way to live or walk around. And we all have periods in our life, I'm sure, where we felt more anxious or more fearful. So Part of understanding the neuroscience is realizing that we all have this experience. Just as we all have felt belonging, we all probably fear about not belonging, even if we're rebel, you know, a bit rebellious or introverts, we still have this deeper underlying sense of belonging. We need to recognize it's normal to have these periods of time where we're overcome with anxiety or stress or worry and understanding the neuroscience and understanding why meditation can help kind of shift the mind. So you have what I like to call a momentary rest from some of that intensity, especially now in these times. So this idea of surrender or loss of control, I want to read a little bit. A couple weeks ago, I did a bunch of reading and this time there was just one in particular um, from a woman named Marion Woodman. She's phenomenal. And this is a little book called Coming Home to Myself. And she speaks about active surrender. And I love what she says here. In defeat, we are forced to lay down our sword. In active surrender, we consciously choose to lay it down. We consciously accept that certain things are beyond our control. We consciously accept that certain things should be beyond our control. Ooh, anybody feel that one? I do. <laughs> we learn to separate out what needs action from what requires our acceptance and embrace. We choose the unknown. 
Practicing active surrender is important because it is as much a source of energy and freedom as taking action is. And it is often needed when we approach situations which love rather than power. There's a few more little, little bits. We know what we feel know what we desire then slowly surrender to accept what is and forgive what might have been the salt of bitterness becomes the salt of wisdom when the path is blocked we can accept or fight when we fight doors slam when we surrender to the mystery and say well what do you need doors open. Life becomes hectic. We try to exert control, create secure little pigeonholes, believe we are in control. And all the time we know chaos leaps eternally at our edges. And lastly, whether we understand it or not, sometimes we know that someone is moving us. To know this is to be known. So on active surrender, Miriam Woodman, I love that concept because the first part of the neuroscience I wanna to speak to is our default mode network. And so some of you might be familiar with neuroscience. If not, I'm gonna give you a very simple little tidbit. I am certainly not an expert. This is just some basic information and I will be referring a little bit to some notes that I jot down in front of me here. So the two modes that we'll talk about is the default mode network and the present centered network. And I'm gonna kind of give you a compare and contrast. So you'll see like the flavors in each and I, I won't have to say much more, I don't think, but I'll expound a little bit before we practice. So the default mode network is this autobiographical sense of self. It's I, it's me, it's mine. You might liken it to ego, but recognizing that this aspect of self is very valuable. So sometimes we hear negative things about ego or this little s, the little self, and it's a part of who we are that we need in order to relate into the world. Now, when we become all consumed about our personality and feeling really unique and individual, that's when we might start to make choices that only benefit us and not really think that, you know, how might this be rippling out into the world? So this I, me, mine sense of self, sometimes it might get a bad rap, but yes, it can keep us kind of hijacked. But if we can point to it and know about it and recognize it's helping me relate in the world to have a sense of personality and how I can then funnel this universal energy into unique expression of whatever that looks like for you, your heartfelt dharma or desires. But it's all about me. So it has this slant perspective. And with that, we're going to be in this mode most of the time. That's why it's called default mode. And how they know that is they hooked up um, people, meditators to the, I think the MRI machines. And when they were told, you know what, just go ahead and relax. You know, you don't need to do anything. We're getting things set up here in the, in the back room. So we'll let you know when we get the experiment started. And so there wasn't any direction. They didn't give them any focus, anything to do. And so they started noticing, okay, when they're in their default mode, this is what's lighting up in the brain. These are the brain structures and it's likened to this sense of self which so happens to be separate. This is where we come into a very dualistic perspective. I'm over here, you're over there, I'm Denny, I'm hungry. It's very personal, this happened to me. And with that, like I said, when it becomes a little bit untamed, we can get into recursive thinking loops. I don't know about you, but I certainly have those thought patterns that keep reemerging in me. And whether it's 
really intense or just subtle in the background, this is where that recursive um, thinking comes in. And part of what keeps us safe is that there's an inherent negativity bias, which can be challenging. So this is where we might pose some challenges and we might feel really separate that we don't belong and have this thought going on and on and on quite a bit. And it's because of this negativity bias that it's gonna be perceived as like really difficult and really challenging. And that's probably why some people say, you know, death to the ego. And it's like, maybe we could befriend it, <laughs> get to know it, get to know that this is this mode in me that's kind of a natural setting in the background. It's here to keep me safe. And in doing so, there needs to be a little bit of separation to identify like I'm over here and am I going to step on a stick or a snake? So that negativity bias is going to say that's always going to be a snake just for self-preservation. So in that way, it's kept us alive. Um, so we can learn to befriend that. We can learn to identify it when it starts to light up in our body and in our mind and experience like, whoa, I got a serious negativity bias. I'm feeling really separate. Um, it's part of this default mode. So you can imagine that being in that mode for long periods of time or only being in that mode can potentially give rise to some stress. And that might show up like anxiety, worry, fear, sadness. So default mode. And then we have this other mode, the present centered network. And there's a couple other modes that we know about that are helping kind of in between that are like moving attention and shifting attention. Um, so it's not just one or the other. It's not ever black and white. So please know that. So by comparison, this present centered network is this non-separate sense of ourself. So when they saw in meditators, when they were reporting this felt sense of well-being or oneness or equanimity, they saw these different brain structures lighting up in the brain and activating and known as the present-centered network. It's also known as the defocusing network. My teacher calls it the present-centered network. And it does feel a little nicer when you hear it. Sometimes defocusing for some, it might not feel so um, uh, present centered, not really self-specific, non-separate equanimity. This is where you'll get clarities and insights and infinite possibilities. I believe a lot of our great thinkers when they were daydreaming were entering into meditative like states, present centered networks. Um, here's the beautiful thing. This is where we can overcome the negativity bias. So that's where we can maybe get those bubble ups of clarity or the little whispers of, oh, I need to take that action now. And I know that. So that present center network is available to us. 